Good afternoon. On behalf of the Center for Community Progress, I'd like to welcome you to today's Cornerstone webinar. My name is Christina Carter Grant, and I serve as the Program Officer for the National Leadership and Education Team here at Community Progress. Cornerstone is our webinar series, which equips participants with the building blocks to understand and solve tough challenges related to property vacancy, abandonment, and deterioration. For today's Cornerstone, we are joined by Daniel Lewinsky, Dr. George Berghorn, and Mae Boley. Daniel Lewinsky oversees the Center for Community Progress's Portfolio of Technical Assistance Programs as the Vice President of Technical Assistance. These programs have helped hundreds of communities across the U.S. equitably reform their vacant property policies and systems. George H. Berghorn is an assistant professor of construction management in the School of Planning, Design, and Construction, and an adjunct assistant professor of forestry at Michigan State University. He earned a PhD in construction management from MSU and a Master of Environmental Studies degree from the Yale University School of the Environment. Prior to entering higher education, he was a construction superintendent and project manager and a policy director for a statewide trade association. May Boley is the executive director of Repurpose Savannah, a nonprofit dedicated to saving and sharing historic buildings at the end of their life cycle. She holds a technical certificate in historic preservation from Savannah Technical College, a master of art in art education from the School of Art Institute in Chicago, and a Bachelor's of Art in Graphic Design and Classical Archaeology from Florida State University. Before turning it over to Danielle, I want to mention that we will allow time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. If you have a question during the presentation, please click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your webinar browser and type your question into the Q&A box. We will share a presentation slides and a video recording of today's presentation in the week following. If you experience any technical difficulties, please send us a message by clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the browser or by sending an email to Christina Carter Grant at ccarter at communityprogress.net. And with that, I will kick it over to Danielle. Great, thank you, Christina. So before we uh, get started today during the webinar, I wanted to get a better sense of who is in the audience. So I thought we would uh, do a couple of quick polls to get uh, that understanding of who's in the room. So Christina, if you pop up the first poll, I wanted to understand who everyone is representing today. So what type of organization are you representing? Uh, again, these may not fit perfectly, but uh, is it a local government for the most part, a state government, federal government? Are you with the nonprofit sector or are you with the private sector? We'll give people just uh, one more second to fill that out. And Christina, if you can pop up the results for everyone. Okay. So somewhat of an even split between local government uh, and nonprofit sector with a, a healthy showing from the private sector as well. So that's, that's really helpful to know. Next up, I wanted to get a sense of where everyone was from in the country. So Christina, if you can pop up the second one. So are you located in the Northeast, the Midwest, the South or the West? Giving people one more second. Great, and Christina, if you can pop up those results. Okay, so generally speaking, Northeast and Midwest, but certainly still have representation from the, the South and West as well. Then lastly, I wanted to get a sense of where everyone is at uh, in terms of their knowledge of deconstruction. So Christina, if you can pop up the last poll. So on a scale of one to five, what's your level of familiarity with deconstruction? So a one being you've only recently heard that term all the way to a five, you've helped to actually lead a deconstruction project. Giving people one more second for that. And then Christina, if you can pop up those results. 
Okay, so really even split more or less across the board. Um, so a wide range of people's knowledge base and also experiences with deconstruction, which is really helpful. So our hope uh, on this webinar is that we'll give everyone at those different skill levels, maybe a little bit of something. Again, as Christina mentioned, if you have questions as we're going through the webinar, please do submit them in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll make sure to save time at the end to get uh, into those questions a bit more. So wanted to start off with a little bit of context for today's webinar. Community progress has been hearing from a variety of communities across the US, many of which are likely on today's call, that supply costs have really been skyrocketing. And the escalation in supply prices have driven up the cost of a really wide range of vacant property reclamation activities. Everything from commercial and residential property rehabilitation, to reuse of vacant lots for community gathering spaces and also new housing construction. And just a really quick polling of some land banks across the US in a wide range of markets, you know, down from uh, Southern states like Georgia all the way to upstate New York, we heard that housing construction prices in the past year rose anywhere from around 15% all the way up to 30% with rehab costs not too far behind that. And as a result of those increases, communities have really needed to cut back their rehabilitation, also infill development work. That's particularly concerning because it puts increased pressure on the availability of quality affordable housing and overall neighborhood revitalization efforts. One of the sources we've heard from communities of escalating costs has been the price of lumber. So to help us get a better handle on what's going on with the price of lumber and how communities might be able to leverage a tool like deconstruction to try and offset some of those costs, we've asked two experts to join us on our webinar today, starting off first with Dr. George Berghorn. Dr. Berghorn, I'll pass it over to you. All right, great. Thanks, Danielle. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, it's, it's really my pleasure to join you all and, and get to talk to, to you all about something that I'm very passionate about and uh, have really been thinking about a lot over the last several years with regard to deconstruction and material salvage and now with the economics of, of lumber being what they are. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more and dive a little bit deeper into some of the issues of, of lumber pricing and where some of that pricing is coming from, where it might be going. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some possible improvements and ways to salvage lumber from uh, deconstruction operations. So I don't wanna brag, um, but this is my garage. This is my lumber pile or about, about two thirds of my lumber pile in my garage, or as I like to call it, uh, my daughter's college investment fund. And I've been doing a lot of work during the pandemic. I'm one of the people that I'll be talking about here in a, a few minutes, uh, but I've been doing a lot of projects during the pandemic. And so I've watched firsthand how retail prices for lumber have changed considerably over the last uh, 16 to 18 months. So if anybody's been keeping up with National Association of Home Builders or other industry groups, that provides some information and tracking of lumber price trends. You've probably seen this chart before, and this just tracks uh, two index prices for lumber over time. Uh, the blue line is the composite price, which is a little bit closer to a wholesale price uh, tracking system. And then the red line tracks the futures prices. So future contracts on lumber because lumber is a commodity and it's sold on a, on a futures contract basis. So you know, we know that recently there's been a lot of uh, attention focused in the press by the fact that lumber prices have come down from their precipitously high uh, point where they were earlier in the summer. So last Friday, uh, lumber futures opened at $454 per thousand board feet. That's down from the high point during the pandemic where lumber closed at over $1,600 per thousand board feet uh, back on May 6th. So we're seeing some signals that, you know, maybe things are getting a little bit better with lumber pricing. This just takes you back, you know, my first chart only went back about eight, nine months. This takes you back uh, to June of 2020. So really when we started seeing the first signals of what was going on uh, post COVID uh, showing up here in the US. 
And the takeaway on this chart that I just want you to see is that even when we look at trend lines with lumber pricing, lumber prices fluctuate greatly. Lumber is a commodity. Commodities tend to do this. I'm going to say it multiple times in this presentation. Lumber prices are volatile, and I hope you can get the sense of that just from looking at uh, two index, uh, two indices that, that are used to track lumber prices over the last uh, year and, and couple of months. Interestingly, as of like 1030 this morning, uh, lumber futures closed at $509 per thousand, uh, down from 515 per thousand, where they were at a, a midpoint uh, yesterday or the day before. So we're seeing prices creep back up. And again, we're seeing some fluctuation on a, on a daily basis. So the question is, you know, what happened? What, what led to this? What caused this? And are we going to see si signals that you know some of these conditions may return again? So for this, I like to uh, lean on one of the greatest economic minds, at least of my generation, to try to help us understand what happened here. So hopefully some of you recognize that brilliant economic mind and what he was talking about, but it really is not voodoo economics. It really was a perfect storm of conditions that led to what we saw in that great ramping up of lumber prices and then uh, the drop-offs that we've seen over the last several months. So I just wanna step through a few of the factors that, that gave rise to that price fluctuation. So right away, as soon as COVID hit, as soon as COVID hit the workforce, sawmills immediately cut production and unloaded their inventory that they had on hand. Sawmills were burned during the economic downturn, during the recession, based on uh, the fact that they were holding on to too much inventory at the time, and they had nowhere to move it. And if we understand that lumber is purchased on futures contracts, so people are paying for, you know, they're, they're buying lumber with pricing today that may not be produced for another six or nine months. So having uh, yards that were full of lumber was obviously not a good thing for these sawmills. So they said, hey, we're not going to get caught a second time in 10 years. We're going to cut production and unload our inventory as quickly as, as possible because of what we think may be coming down uh, the pike with uh, COVID. At the same time, like I mentioned, people were staying home. The number of, of people doing DIY projects grew. There's a little bit of influence from the housing market in there as well, uh, in that housing supply has been just very tight across the country. So just like we saw during the recession, although for different reasons, people started putting some of their money into DIY projects instead of looking to buy uh, new homes. So mills are cutting production, they're unloading whatever inventory they have, but now we're starting to see an uptick in demand because DIY projects are growing. And then we saw a major boost in demand and we saw a housing boom that started really about three months after COVID made its way to the US where uh, the Fed cut their interest rate to near zero. Well, as soon as the Fed cut their interest rate to near zero, all of a sudden we saw a purchasing boom for housing. So as my economist friend would say, anybody, anybody want to take a guess at then what happened as a result of that. And we saw people buying houses at rates uh, that we had really not seen before. And this is all happening right in the midst of the pandemic. So the bottom line is the mills hedged wrong. They went the wrong way. They saw what was going on, cut supply or cut production, dumped supply really quickly and didn't account for the fact that there was gonna be this growing demand for their products throughout the pandemic. And so you can see in this chart, you've got two housing market indicators. The blue line is new starts and the orange line is homeowner improvement and repair activity. The dip that you see right here, this is early in the pandemic. This is basically March through June of 2020. So new housing starts bottomed out for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was a lot of states construction was not deemed to be an essential enterprise. So new starts dropped, but homeowner improvement and repair activity picked up during that same time. And the bottom line is the mills read the tea leaves wrong. They thought that drop, that three month drop was the start of another precipitous decline. And in part, it was bolstered by the fact that some trade associations had been talking about the coming of a mini recession sometime around 2021. 
And so they took that information, looked at what was going on, said, well, maybe we're standing on the cliff looking at the start of a new mini recession and production, they, they just went the wrong way with production. Let's, let's put it that way. Now we start to see some interesting changes in the housing market. Um, the supply demand imbalance, of course, has led to house prices to go up drastically. Um, new construction prices have gone up drastically because of lumber prices. And what we've started to see in the last six months or so is that you've got a combination of factors where new builders are starting to hold construction back because of those increased prices due to lumber uh, cost increases. And they're sort of further tightening up supply on the new construction side. So there's a little bit of exacerbation of the problem going on and new home sale prices and existing home sale prices continue to rise. But we've seen some change recently and I'll, I'll get to that here in a minute. So where this is going, what, what it looks like as of today. Uh, analysts are a little bit divided on where things are going. Uh, some, some analysts believe that lumber prices are gonna remain volatile and above their long-term average until sometime in 2022. I tend to put myself in that camp, although I'm not an, econo an, an economist, uh, but I do tend to put myself in that camp that, that uh, small scale volatility will continue to keep lumber prices elevated over their long-term average for at least another year or so. Uh, we also know that retail prices lag wholesale trends. So when you look at those trend charts, you also have to keep in mind that those are sale prices on the market, not retail prices. Um, and for small home builders, they often can't take advantage of wholesale pricing either. They're often at the mercy of retail pricing. So retail pricing is expected to continue to lag those wholesale price trends for at least a few more months before we start to see any sort of sense of, of potential stability. Um, the other interesting part in this is that we know that there's some talk about uh, doubling the Canadian lumber tariff. Uh, we should know more about that this fall. But there is some concern that if the decision is made to double the tariff that's currently on Canadian softwood lumber, that that may also cause another perturbation in the system and lead to higher prices uh, for lumber at that point. Of course, things like fires out west, fires in Canada continue to have the potential to constrain long-term long supply of lumber. Uh, and so those are things that have to be watched carefully. And like I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have to watch housing markets. And I want you to look at this lower uh, piece of, of news uh, from Reuters from about a month ago. U.S. housing starts are accelerating, so new construction is really taken off, um, but building permits are skidding to an eight-month low. So there's a little bit of speculative building that's been out there. Um, there's some work that was under contract that's starting. So there's that lag between homes going under contract and when construction actually starts on them. But what we're now starting to see is that new construction permits uh, are starting to slow down in part because uh, for millennials in particular, uh, the housing market in the US is starting to price itself out of their ability uh, to reach it and participate in uh, the home buying process. If we just take a quick look uh, at some weekly uh, home sale data across the United States from the last two years, 2020's in red, 2021's in orange. You can see here that in the second week of August of this year, the year over year increase uh, for new home sales in the US, I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah, this is new construction home sales in the US uh, is down 17.7%. If we trend that line across and look at where that happened in 2020, we find that we didn't hit a year over year decrease in new sales until we look back to like April of 20. So the beginning of the pandemic, when uncertainty was maybe at the highest point that it's been in the last year and a half, that's the last time that we saw new home sales drop off as precipitously um, as we're seeing them drop off right now. So this may be a signal that again, buyers being priced out of the market may soften uh, some of the supply demand imbalance in housing and may start to cause prices to come back down. If we just look at uh, some national data for new construction in red versus existing construction in blue, 
nationally, what we're seeing uh, by the start of 2021, this is all January of 2021 data. By the start of this year, we saw new construction and existing uh, significantly dropping off uh, across the US. Uh, if we look at Austin, Texas, which is the fastest growing metro in the US, we see that new construction has again dropped off precipitously uh, in part because of what was going on with lumber pricing, which put a little pressure back on the existing homes market. And you see that little upward tick at the start of 2021 as people couldn't get into new homes. So they started putting a little pressure back on the existing homes market in Austin. But then if we go to the slowest growing metro in the US, which happens to be here in Michigan, Flint, again, you see what looks more like the national picture, the drop off in existing home sales, as well as the drop off in new construction sales. So I'm showing you these things again to sort of just express market volatility and where some of this uncertainty comes from. But the bottom line really is that commodity markets in general are volatile, lumber is no different. Uh, the housing market has maybe been, you know, even more volatile in some ways than uh, the lumber market's been over the last year, year and a half, uh, but, but long term over the last three to four years. And lumber and housing markets are inextricably linked. So when you push on one, there's a pushback from the other side. You, you really can't think about housing and lumber as, as you know, separate markets. And to prove that out, this is just looking at... Um, uh, domestic lumber production. So the blue and black uh, lines are just uh, southern yellow pine and western spruce pine fir, two by four uh, lumber prices. That's the blue and black line. And I'm just pointing out these two peaks. This is old data. This is pre-COVID because I just want you to see what it looks like before you add COVID into the system. Uh, so if you look at the two peaks there, the takeaway is that the red line is new single family home sales in the U.S., and new sales are a leading indicator of what's gonna happen with pricing of construction lumber. As you start to see these peaks up in new sales, look at that, you don't have to go too much farther, six months to 12 months further, and you see corresponding bumps up in the price of lumber. So again, house sales in the US can be thought of as a leading indicator in some ways, at least right now uh, for lumber pricing. And then here's the Canadian situation. The blue and black lines in this case are uh, Canadian OSB and Canadian softwood uh, plywood. And you see the same thing. You see, those, you see those increases in their prices and they're lagged uh, or they're led rather by increases in new single family houses sold in the US. So even the Canadian lumber market is sensitive to things that happen with the US housing market. So we really can't think about uh, housing and lumber as being separate in any case. Uh, other pressures are starting to complicate uh, matters as well. So uh, again, things like fire, other issues related to supply of standing timber uh, does start to complicate matters a little bit further. So the future trend right now, like I said, I feel pretty confident in projecting that we're going to see continued volatility and continued prices above the long-term average, at least sometime into 2022. Uh, we may see some seasonal dips through winter as the housing market slows down anyway, goes kind of through its, its cyclical down period in the winter months in the North and the East. Um, and I think we'll see probably another increase uh, in the spring because really not much is being done to add new housing supply uh, to the mix across the United States. So we're going to continue to be in a supply constrained uh, environment, at least for the foreseeable future with housing. So a couple of things to talk about real quickly, uh, looking at, at what's going on with uh, virgin lumber. There may be some opportunity to bring salvaged lumber into the mix. Uh, this is some work that we're doing in my lab at MSU. This is just some mechanical property testing of salvaged lumber. And the takeaway is, really everything except for this gray bar on the left side. So if you start at 1.4 million PSI and look forward, this was a group of 68 samples of salvaged lumber that we tested for its modulus of elasticity, which is one of the key mechanical properties that, that are used for grading lumber. And you can see that 67 of our 68 samples that we've tested have adequate uh, MOE values to be used structurally or to be reused structurally. 
Of course, we know that the cost of this material can be high. We've estimated that salvaged lumber can cost as much as $833 per thousand board feet to harvest and transport to its point of final use. Contrast that you know, with, with futures prices right now hovering around 500. It's better than where it's been, right? I mean, normal virgin material pricing in Michigan is like $160 per thousand for timber on the stump and $450 per thousand uh, for lumber futures in the Great Lakes states. So we're still above that, but we're not as far above as we used to be given the uncertainty uh, in, in, in volatility in lumber pricing right now. So my argument in part is that salvage material can help to dampen some of those peaks and valleys that you saw in those long-term uh, trend charts for lumber pricing. There also may be an opportunity to start if we if we get into some kind of a carbon economy in Michigan or nationally uh, to look at uh, some carbon credits that are involved with getting this material and that may further add value to this product uh, so that you're not looking at such a big price difference between virgin uh, and salvaged material. Uh, this is just two case studies from here in Lansing, a, a demolition house on the left, a decon house on the right. And you can basically see the takeaway is that while it takes significantly longer to deconstruct 134 worker hours versus 32, you also now have to invest 126 worker hours to denail that lumber before it can be reused, uh, which doesn't exist in the, in the demolition case where the material is just landfilled. So there is some process inefficiency. That process inefficiency is recognized nationally. This is a national survey we did a couple of years ago. And we asked people to just rank the currently available tools for removing fasteners from lumber are adequate to perform this task safely, cost effectively, and efficiently. And you know, this is I, I, I say this is a resounding meh, right? If if three is neutral, the average response is 2.9. So slightly on the disagree side of neutral. So people are not in this industry are not particularly enamored of the efficiency and cost effectiveness of tools that they have to prep lumber, which is which contributes to that $833 per thousand board foot cost. So we're now starting to look at, can we automate some of these functions? Can we automate denailing? Can we automate the identification of lead-based paint? Can we automate visual grading, dimensioning of lumber, identifying damage, cutting to length and width and tagging and inventorying in an effort to make a more cost effective two by four or two by six or whatever it may be uh, from deconstruction projects. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. I see there's questions in the chat and I'm sure we'll be getting to all of them in just a little bit. Thank you. And uh, now as I transition out, May Boley is going to talk to everyone about deconstruction. Hello. Um, I'm also very glad to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Let me share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? I'll take silence as a yes. All right. Um, first of all, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of the work George does. I think he really sees into the future of this industry. So it's an honor to appear with him today and talk about what it's like in the field. Uh, my name is Mabel Lee, and I am the executive director of a nonprofit in Savannah, Georgia, that reclaims building materials. Um, okay, so let's start right at the beginning. What is deconstruction? Uh, deconstruction is the process of systematically unbuilding a building in the opposite order that it was built, with the goal of harvesting as much materials for reuse as possible. That's the simple definition, but once you dig into the industry, it does get a good bit more complicated than that. So there's like uh, multiple different kinds of deconstruction and they all feed very different business models. And this is a very much an emerging industry, even though it absolutely has roots in traditional practice. Um, demolition as we think of it today, didn't really come into popular use until after World War II. And before that, most buildings were uh, what they called a hand wrecked. They were hand wrecking crews to harvest materials because it didn't make good sense to throw them in the landfill when you could reuse them. So um, today we look at three major types, 
of deconstruction on the market. Um, Non-structural is probably the most common. Sometimes you hear this referred to as soft stripping. Uh, it's where you go in and you pull out the super easy stuff. You pop out the windows, like this is Christiana on my crew doing just that. You pull out the mantle, you might go for the hardwood floor, the really easy stuff. Um, and for the most part, this service is either offered at a very low cost or free uh, for the value of the materials. The next type of deconstruction is what I call structurally compromising decon. Um, some people would call this poaching, where people would go into a building and take out the structural elements that are easy to get at that are high value, like floor joists. Uh, flooring obviously would come out first, and then you'd start cutting out the floor joists. You might even go into the walls, pull off drywall, and start taking out the studs. Uh, maybe you want to pull out every two out of every three studs. So the building literally doesn't fall down on top of you while you're working and then just get out of there and leave the rest, thing, the rest of the building to be crushed by an excavator in typical decon or demolition fashion. The third variety is full service structural removal. This is the service that my nonprofit offers uh, in the field where we go in, we get, we get a contract in place of a demolition company, which means I will definitely be getting paid to do this work. We can't afford to do it for free. Um, but it costs us a lot more. So that's something I'm gonna be talking about as, as I get into this presentation a good bit. We have to uh, match sort of the price of demolition, wrecking demolition on the open market in order to get contracts. But we of course gain the asset of the materials which we can then sell to try to close the gap. Um, okay, so these types of activities feed some retail operations that are all very distinct. Uh, reuse retail is also an emerging field right along with um, deconstruction. Some of it has a little bit more of a legacy. So like architectural salvage is the one that most people are really familiar with. It's been around for as long as there's been cool old stuff in buildings and it will continue to be around as long as there's cool old stuff in buildings. For the most part though, architectural salvage is dealing with finish. They're dealing with uh, visible decorative elements in a house, corables, fireplace mantles, doorknobs, hardware, windows, all the beautiful things that you see when you're experiencing a historic building. There's also a low cost building material market. This tends to be more often than not conducted by nonprofits that are otherwise funded because the value of low cost building materials is, is even lower than. Um, so, so what we're talking about are contemporary materials, materials that are not particularly valuable because of their age or patina that are secondhand. So they don't even match the price of what you could go and buy at a big box building material store. They're gonna be lower in value than even those materials. And this market, like I said, usually often has to be funded or subsidized in some way in order to be viable. And then of course, there are the luxury building materials. This is a photo of some hand-hewn beams, which fetch a very high price on the market. They show evidence of ax marks, tool use from the craftsmen 100, 150, 200 years ago. Um, this is, so our company deals in all of these sectors, which is a challenge. Not only are we providing service in the field, but also retailing across several markets, but we are in sort of an isolated location there isn't a robust market in architectural salvage or reuse material here in Savannah or in this area. So we sort of have to wear all these hats, but you will find for the, for the most part, these businesses tend to be partitioned. Somebody will either be a luxury building materials dealer, or there'll be a nonprofit that tries to get low cost building materials to people who need home repair, or there'll be an architectural salvage operation. Okay, um, so one of the big questions that we're talking about today is whether or not deconstruction could help address some of the lumber cost and supply chain issues. Certainly, we are fully independent from what you would consider to be normative supply chain conversation. Our supply is entirely local. We had an absolute glut of material during the pandemic while everybody else was running out and their prices were going up. Ours were going down. Yep. And, uh, and that's because everybody, the housing market was booming. So we were very busy. We got a lot of jobs. A lot of people were taking buildings down. A lot of people were doing DIY projects. So we did about three times as much business in the first year of the pandemic as we did the year before. Uh, so effectively, because my prices were already well above what you would consider for new building materials, what happened for us was we, 
the market sort of came up to meet us. And, and because I had such an influx of materials and such an increased market, and because I really wanted um, to be moving material out of my lumber yard, in some cases, we actually lowered our prices to try to facilitate that increase in business. And so people could have access for projects that they wanted to get done at home. Uh, whether or not, whether or not I can run a cost competitive business uh, in reclaimed lumber by comparison to virgin lumber, I don't know. That's a really tough question to answer. I love to be doing more low cost building material interface with the local community in, in, in areas where that those materials are sorely needed. For the most part, we make our bread and butter on, on the high end materials. So in the sense that, in the sense like George was saying, if, if, if salvaged lumber could be graded and sold for structural framing use, I don't know that we could match. I, I don't know that it's possible to sell sort of used framing lumber at the same price as regular framing lumber. All very interesting to see how this is all gonna shake out, but it's, it's gonna require a lot of help on the part of local governments and some, some pretty important factors will help help us negotiate that market. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. So um, the benefits of deconstruction versus demolition are very, very many. I love to talk about this. Of course, I'm always pitching. Um, we're gonna talk about all of these as they go through my slides. The first obvious benefit is environmental. Construction and demolition is the single biggest contributor to North American landfills. I um, have it on this chart right here, municipal solid waste and construction and demolition waste, and construction and demolition waste is more than twice as much. So we're producing a lot of garbage. The average American house by weight is roughly equivalent to the total amount of garbage produced by an American over the course of their lifetime. So every house we keep out of the landfill, we're offsetting an entire person's life. That makes a pretty big difference on an environmental scale when you, when you nationalize it. If this were to scale up and become more normal, we'd, we'd have a very significant environmental impact. Uh, very quickly, just to talk about sort of the carbon cycle and, you know, George mentioned um, carbon consideration and future policy, which I think will be a huge deal for deconstruction. Trees eat CO2 out of the environment. Then those trees go to build houses. And then as those houses start to age out, they represent a risk or a liability in a local community, uh, either to homeowners or municipalities which then orders them to be demolished where they are put in a landfill. And when that wood begins to deteriorate, of course, it, it releases all of its CO2 back into the environment, which contributes to and accelerates climate change, which increases the intensity and frequency of storms, which increases the risk and liability of buildings. And it's a vicious cycle. A new model is trees eat CO2. We make houses out of them. We start to view these when they reach a certain point as assets for the community rather than as risk and liability. They're harvested before critical loss. And that means, you know, we're not gonna wait till the building collapses or we're not gonna wait until it's to the point where it's literally unsafe to work in or take apart. Let's just go ahead and make this more normal, normalize this behavior. And if there's no will to save a house, you know, let's go ahead and take care of it when it's still got its best quality. And that's also true for urban trees, which are which are often cut down because they become a risk and liability. They can be milled in, into lumber as a local resource. And then the, the results of this model are not a bunch of CO2 going back into the, uh, the environment, but the creation of jobs, the creation of a product with value, which creates and stimulates local economy. And then of course, something that's a little less tangible, but the circulation of meaning in a local community, something that I find to be uh, a, a big value add for our product. Uh, those materials then can, of course, go into repair any other buildings which may have been considered at risk and reduce the amount of um, structural liability that we face. And of course, the result is a whole bunch of really great stuff for the local community. Um, job creation is a huge factor in deconstruction versus demolition equation. Some studies show that as many as six workers are needed for deconstruction for every one in demolition. In our case, we seize that opportunity to provide a training program for women. Uh, construction and demolition is one of the most heavily male dominated fields there are. So we work to provide training opportunities via deconstruction for, um, to, for training to help close the gender gap in the industry. And our graduates of our apprenticeship program are very highly skilled and able to go work in a number of um, industry sectors. Uh, the 
construction and demolition industry, $7.4 billion industry. Only 10% of those jobs are held by women, only one in 100 site workers. Uh, and we'd like to see that become a little bit more equitable. Okay, there's also a public health concern with demolition. Public health in regards to the um, hazardous materials that tend to exist in building. Not only the super toxic ones like lead paint and asbestos, but also just the gypsum dust from plaster demolition, any number of uh, toxins that can be harmful to your body if it's they're turned into particulate. So traditional demolition, or I should say conventional demolition, absolutely crushes the building, creates a big uh, dust cloud, and that dust cloud affects the health of the immediate neighbors. In, in, in really um, high-end context, you'll often see um, the best solution the market has come up with is to pay a guy to sit there with a water hose and spray the job site to keep the dust down, which of course is not super environmentally sound. Um, and a, a pretty big and important consideration with regards to this is who is affected. Uh, at least in Savannah, the black community bears the brunt of the harmful effects of demolition dust and nobody is spraying water on these job sites. Um, these materials are also super unique. This is a little heart I made out of some heart pine and the ring density in it is un, unparalleled. These materials can't be produced by the conventional market. Uh, if people are looking to try to match certain materials in their historic home, you can't go to Home Depot to find those products. It's also just inherently valuable and beautiful in its own right. Many of these um, tree species are extinct or endangered now. The materials are, the conditions in which these trees grew are not replicable. Our old, our old growth forests are gone. So there is a finite amount of this material on the planet and putting it in the landfill is not its highest and best use. Other benefits for deconstruction are that it's a little bit slower. That's a challenge I'll talk about later, but it does provide an educational opportunity. We always have students from the local colleges, SCAD, Savannah Tech, Armstrong, every, every college in town sends students out to our job sites. You can learn a lot for construction industry. You can learn a lot for historic preservation. The student in the middle is a drafting student who produces um, drawings for us. So we put a lot of energy and effort into capturing, uh, doing what we call research and documentation. So we are capturing the essence of the building before we remove it from the landscape, as well as capturing the histories and stories that are attached to this. And this is in stark contrast to the ethos of um, out of sight, out of mind that's embodied in conventional demolition and replacing it one with one that's very focused on care. It's very focused on provenance, stories, histories, and increasing the value of these materials by contextualizing them. Also, as I noted before, if most demolition is occurring in neighborhoods that are low income or minority, that also is tantamount to somewhat of a bit of a historical erasure. So we try to work to make sure that even though buildings are coming down, the histories aren't being erased. Here's another example from our website. You can read all about every house we've ever taken down in our digital repurposed neighborhood. Challenges, challenges to growing this emerging industry are very many. And I could talk about this all day, but I'll try to keep it short because we're running out of time. Um, yeah, so if there's six laborers for every one laborer, that is a lot more cost. Labor cost is the single biggest challenge to deconstruction because at this point we are competing with demolition. If a person can get their building torn down for a far, far more affordable price, unless they're a saint and have some other reason for going with a more costly service, they're going to go with demolition. So we have to match our pricing, uh, but our but our cost is much higher. I work really hard to try to break even on the job site so that we can, you know, make a profit on the sale of materials, which we haven't even begun to process yet at the end of that um, job site. So we still have labor costs to invest in processing those materials before we can bring them to market. Sometimes I'm unsuccessful in breaking even. Sometimes we lose money on the job site and then have a, have a steeper hill to climb when it comes to selling those materials, processing them and selling them. That's the hugest, the, the hugest challenge that there is. It's also much slower. It takes significantly more time to deconstruct a house than it does to crush it and put it in the landfill. So this can be accommodated if with a little bit of planning and foresight. Unfortunately, the existing, you know, well-oiled machine of construction and demolition really kind of waits until the last minute, pulls the trigger on a quick demo because they don't need to accommodate time. And then it's off to the races on the new building. Um, you could not start a deconstruction at the same point at which you would start a demolition without significantly delaying 
your construction timeline, you'd have to start earlier. So it's a little shift in, in, in the way that things are sort of currently processed and in the planning stages. Usually there's more than enough time on these projects if you get started early, but it's something to consider is uh, where demolition is fast and cheap, deconstruction is slow, slow and expensive. We're also competing against what I like to refer to as sort of the cottage industry. Uh, I call it like Bubba with a backhoe. So like if we're competing with very professional above board demolition companies, the prices tend to be a little bit higher because they have to deal with safety, et cetera, et cetera. But when we're competing with the cottage industry, in many cases, we're seeing people who were not even applying for a demo permit. And that's hardly ever, you know, uh, regulated against, or there's not a whole lot of punitive measures taken against people who are doing demolition without a demo permit. They're certainly not having the building tested for hazardous materials, and then also having it abated for those hazardous materials, which we, we of course do, and every demolition company should do on every project. And uh, for the most part, they're not carrying a lot of insurance. Our nonprofit has to carry four kinds of insurance. So you can see how very quickly competing with the cottage industry makes it almost impossible for us to secure those jobs. So those buildings are gonna be going to the landfill. If a person can get one guy in a backhoe with a bunch of dumpsters to take a building down in two days and pocket thousands of dollars in profit at a price point that's still significant low, significantly lower than what I would need to break even, you know, that's a huge challenge. Um, there are no, before I switch forward, there are no government classifications that describe decon. There are no codes, no local government. The local government here doesn't know what to classify us as. The, the national government doesn't have any classification codes for us. Something that we can do some work to produce, which might help us feel a little bit more legitimate and recognizable. Um, there's also not a lot of public awareness about this. This is an awareness raising campaign. It's an emerging industry. So we've got a long way to go before people even realize that this is a viable alternative. That means there are scant existing markets in our region. Like I said, we're in a bit of a bubble. So we're not only trying to build a business that spans the operations of four or five distinct businesses, but we are also trying to build a market, a regional market for our products and raise public awareness all at the same time. Uh, the supply from historic buildings or reclaimed buildings from, from, de from deconstruction is unpredictable. Uh, while we never run out of supply, I can't tell you from month to month what we're going to have in stock. Is it going to be stuff from the 1940s? Is it going to be stuff from the 1870s? You know, is it going to be true dimension two by four? It's going to, the building material stock is, or building stock is as varied as it could be. So building material supply is often very varied and unpredictable. In some ways this adds some, you know, glamour and allure, but in other ways it presents a real challenge to running a business. Uh, let's talk a little bit about success stories. Portland is the first city in America to institute a policy requiring historic buildings to be deconstructed. And when they first put their ordinance in place in 2016, it was buildings that were 1915 and older. And since then they've had it, it's been such a success that they've moved the date up to 1940 and older. So it doesn't mean you can't remove your building. It just means you have to hire a deconstruction expert. And as the deconstruction community in Portland no longer has to compete with demolition, the price of that service has gone up. Interestingly, uh, in more than 50% of the buildings that were deconstructed, additional asbestos or hazardous materials were discovered in the course of the deconstruction, which means even in buildings where demolition companies were testing for and abating hazardous materials and then crushing the building, there was still likely hazardous materials in about half of those buildings and that dust cloud was affecting the neighbors. So this is, I think, a very strong case to argue for deconstruction as a preferred methodology. Another unexpected consequence was that uh, de the demolitions went down. When the cost of removing a building goes up, the desire to just remove it versus repair it goes down. So we've seen more historic buildings getting repaired uh, as opposed to being removed from the landscape. I'm a preservationist, so I consider that a pretty big win. Um, here's a couple pictures of my crew and I'm about at time. I just wanted to also indicate that there are a number of other cities in North America that are adopting deconstruction policy. Baltimore, this, the mayor just uh, or produced an executive order. I'm sorry, not Baltimore, Pittsburgh. An executive order requiring all court ordered demolitions or demolitions that are being conducted by the city to be deconstructed instead of demolished. 
Palo Alto has a 100% demolition is illegal. All buildings must be deconstructed local ordinance. We're working on one here in Savannah. This is a place that's sort of marked and characterized by its historic buildings and pro um, properties. So it really ought to be a place where historic buildings in particular are protected from demolition. And I am gonna wrap it up there. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you, May. And uh, before we move on to uh, questions, and May, if you can just kill your screen share real quick, I just wanted to pop up one slide. Yeah. Um, so despite all of the remarkable benefits of deconstruction as May so eloquently just laid out, um, if your community is facing a scenario where you have uh, more buildings to remove, more structures to remove than you have funding for, making the case for deconstruction can be particularly challenging. Um, you know, especially when you have um, some local leaders who are really focused on trying to uh, take as many buildings down as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible. So uh, funding has always been a challenge for deconstruction. Uh, to that end, I want to highlight one uh, opportunity for every single community on this call. The American Rescue Plan Act did a number of wonderful things. One of the things I wanted to highlight though today was specifically the state and local fiscal recovery funds. So that was 350 billion, that's billion with a B, um, plus an additional 10 billion in infrastructure funding. That funding uh, goes to every single state, every single county, every single tribal government, and every single municipality in the US. It's actually the first time federal government has funded all uh, nearly 20,000 municipalities across the United States. And that funding um, needs to be used to try and respond to the negative economic consequences of, of COVID. And that's either resulting from specifically COVID or um, uh, exacerbated by the economic decline caused by COVID. So governments have really broad latitude for how they use that funding. I'm not gonna go into it all here because we don't have time, but I'll tell you that the short point here is that funding used for job creation, job training, creation of new affordable housing, um, structure removal in some instances can be eligible. So I, I definitely wanted to call this out because it is a new infusion of funding and funding that can be used. Communities are currently considering how to remove structures, how to build new structures, deconstruction and material salvage certainly should be a part of that conversation. So if you're not aware of what your local county and state governments are doing with that funding, certainly do get engaged in those conversations. All of the funding needs to be obligated by the end of 2024, but needs to be spent by 2026. Uh, definitely check out Treasury's website. I've got the link here. You'll get the slide after um, the, the end with a, a couple of blogs from Community Progress. So with that, May and George, if you pop your cameras back on, we don't have a ton of time to get through questions, but I'm gonna to try to assemble a number of these questions together. May, I'll probably start with you, but George, if you have some thoughts here. So May, the simple question is, how do we find May in my community? So if I'm a local government and I'm interested in deconstruction, who do I call, who do I find? If I'm a local business and I wanna do more deconstruction, just where do I start? Yeah, well, start with the National Association, which is called Build Reuse. I'm a board member. George, you're also a board member. Uh, so they've assembled a list, you can, you can browse it on the website of at least their members, if not every service provider that we're aware of, but even if you can't um, find somebody listed on the website who's in your local area, get in touch with the association, they might know somebody anyways. Uh, that's a great place to start. You can also hit us up, feel free to call me, I have a, it's a pretty small community as it is an emerging industry, I'm very happy to try to help people connect with services. I'm also, and there are a number of people who run deconstruction outfits around the country who are available for consulting, so maybe just someone could come out and provide a training to a local construction crew that's interested in adding a service to their offering. There's a lot of things that local communities can do to try to, to, try to get the ball rolling, just talk to us. George, any other thoughts beyond what May shared there? Nope, I think she hit okay. it. Um, May, back to you. Uh, how long did it take you to deconstruct? And you know, what percent of projects would you say in your local area enabled deconstruction? Okay, it takes us about eight weeks to do an average size house. Less if it's a one story, more if it's got a lot of masonry. It's very mutable. 
um, and unpredictable. I can usually give a pretty good estimate once I put my eyeballs on a building, but I would say count on at least eight weeks. Our crew is relatively small though. We're not super well-funded. I'd love to be uh, doubling the size of my crew. I, I have a, a, lo a long list of resumes in my inbox and I can't quite afford to hire everybody. Uh, and that could be different. It could be different if we were uh, supported by a local policy and things of that nature, we could be moving a lot faster. And that's really something that's a major goal for the entire industry of deconstruction is to be able to get quicker at this. That's going to help with the market a great deal. Mm -hmm. And then your so, question was how many buildings in the community? Yeah, yeah, about, yeah, exactly. We're a drop in the bucket. I, I think we, we've developed quite a good reputation in town. So for the most part, if a historic building is coming down, we're talking to them, but I only secure maybe 50% of the proposals that I write and I'm not writing a proposal for every historic building that's coming down. And I do specialize specifically in historic buildings. So we're not touching more contemporary buildings or commercial buildings. I would uh, if we could make it viable, but we're not. So we're, we're the only operator in our area and we have got a long way to go towards diverting you know, significant tonnage from the landfill. Mm -hmm. There's sort of a broad question here. Um, and so May and, and uh, Dr. Bernhardt, I'll throw it probably both to you guys. Uh, but with respect to deconstruction and efficiency and sort of the cost competitive nature of it, what steps are, are being taken to make it more efficient? Uh, George, there's sort of a question in there about one of the comments you made about inefficiency. So I'm trying to jumble a few questions together. Um, and I suppose I'd throw that in there also, you know, is, is this just an issue of funding that if we had funding to advance some of the technology sort of it's there, it's just not quite scaled. So, so that's a few sort of thrown in, in a general bucket, May and George, I'll let you take it in any direction. So if, if construction is viewed or considered as not being a very technologically advanced industry, within construction, deconstruction sort of leads leads the lag. And I mean, this is no disrespect to May or to anyone else that's doing the work. It's just, it's a manual process. And that's where the inefficiency uh, comes from. If you wish to save the material right now, the only way to do that is to manually handle everything, right? I mean, if, 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 if you wanna get it structural lumber, you have to manually strip off sheathing, siding, uh, uh, gypsum board, right? All of it has to be manually taken off for the, and you're not going to sell a lot of that. You're only going to sell some of what you end up with. So that's where we've been sort of motivated to look at some technology pieces, to look at some supply chain uh, efficiencies, sort of more of like, how do we create like hub and spoke type systems for supply chains to aggregate material and, and move larger quantities around um, but I, it's not a simple answer. And, and you know, I, I would say that, yeah, there's definitely more and in, more investment needed in looking at some of these issues, because frankly, deconstruction has not attracted a ton of outside uh, funding interest to this point. What do you think, May? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, this is I, oh, gosh, I am so eager for George's prototype <laughs> denail machine and the if I could leave one person at my lumber yard running product through, through a machine and having progress you know, happen while my crew is at the job site deconstructing the next house, this would be a game changer. I wouldn't be sitting here talking about how much we need funding. I mean, maybe I would still, but it would be a game changer. I, I like to liken it all the time. You know, if, 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 if the milling industry was still trying to put tongue and groove on floorboards using hand planes, they wouldn't be competitive in the market. You know, we're still using hand planes. We're using crowbars. We're using hammers. We're using nail pullers that are maybe at best powered by a pneumatic air pump. It's slow. It's a lot of work, but, but there's obvious areas for improvement in, in the technology and something like a denailing conveyor belt, at least for a low grade material would save us an enormous amount of time. I, I, I can't wait. I want him to prototype it in our place in Savannah. It's coming, right? Uh, spoke, spoke with a roboticist yesterday who's working awesome. on a prototype. Yeah. Make it happen. Excellent. Unfortunately, we're going to need to stop Q&A there. We left some other questions on the table about how may you handle sort of asbestos and other contaminants in the process. So um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all the Q&As. Uh, Christina, I'm going to hand it back to you, but May and Dr. Berghorn, thank you so much. This was such a rich conversation. Excellent information. I could go on for another few hours talking about this. So thank you all so much. And Christina, I'll hand it back to you.
Thanks, Danielle. Yes, amazing presentations today. Thank you to all of our panelists and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, please be sure to visit our website for more information on this webinar as well as our upcoming webinars. Have a great afternoon, everyone.